Hello, and welcome back to the Criterion Collectors Podcast, brought to you by 25yearslatersite.com. I'm your co-host, Rosalie Lewis. And I'm your other co-host, Tim Rosenberger. And on Criterion Collectors, we discuss movies that are available as part of the Criterion Collection, as well as movies available on the Criterion Channel. Today, we're focusing on the Coker Trilogy, which is three films directed by the late, great Iranian filmmaker Abbas Kiarostami. And, you know, he's well known for other films as well, including Close Up, A Taste of Cherry, uh, Like Someone in Love, and Certified Copy. But the Coker trilogy was really where I feel like he made his initial mark outside of Iran and started gaining attention from other sectors. Um, He had many fans among famous filmmakers, including the likes of Martin Scorsese and even uh, Kurosawa proclaimed his love for Abbas Kiarostami. So he's definitely a well-known and well-appreciated filmmaker. And he joins many other well-known Iranian filmmakers who make up what's known as the Iranian New Wave. So people like Jafar Panahi, Asghar Farhadi, Mohsen Makhmabaf, and the list goes on. But he was probably the most well-known out of that list. And I was excited to dive into his earlier work because I had not seen this trilogy before. I had only seen his later films. So uh, we're going to start off with Where is the Friend's House, which is from 1987. And then we'll dive into Life and Nothing More, which came out in 92. And Through the Olive Trees in 1994 will complete the trilogy. But before we get started on our first movie, I'm curious, Tim, had you seen any of Kiristami's work before? No, I have not. I know we had mentioned, because I think it came, they released it this, sometime this year. Uh, we have talked briefly about uh, Taste of Cherry and how I was interested to see that and just to see um, an Iranian film in general. But I think that was it. And I don't think I realized until partway through watching the trilogy that he had done Taste of Cherry. So um, I wasn't even aware that I was seeing some of his work, uh, seeing some of the same work of the director who did Taste of Cherry. So, But yeah, no, I went into this kind of not really knowing anything about him or his style or what he likes to do or whatever. I kind of learned stuff as I was going and as I researched stuff uh, post-watching them. Yeah, I think this is one of those trilogies where you can go in blind and it can be great, or you can learn a lot about the context and it'll still be great. I think I did a little bit of research before I watched. It sounds like, you know, Tim, maybe you went in a little with more fresh eyes than I did. So I'll be interested, you know, to compare our experiences. Um, So the first movie is Where is the Friend's House? And again, this one took place in 1987. Um, It was filmed in the city of Koker as well as Poshta. These are both cities in remote Iran, probably I think about 250 miles from Tehran. So really remote villages. And the story follows young boys, mainly one young boy named Ahmad who is, he's about eight years old and in a classroom where the teacher is scolding the kids for being too loud. He's threatening to expel people for not doing their homework in these special notebooks that they have to have and generally kind of seems like a jerk. So the kids are a little scared of him and especially Ahmad. And so when he gets home and realizes that he accidentally took his friend's notebook in addition to his own, he thinks, well, I better give it back to him. But this is easier said than done. Um, First of all, Ahmad's mom really doesn't see the necessity of doing this. And she says, well, if your friend gets expelled, that's his own fault. And she wants him to help out around the house, go get some bread and do his own homework. But Ahmad can't let this go. And so eventually he makes the journey over the zigzagging hilltop through the trees and over to this other neighboring village, Poshta, where he continuously asks people if they know where his friend lives. And many people have no idea or give him a lead that turns out to be not quite correct. And it seems like a fruitless exercise in a lot of ways as the night goes on and it gets darker and darker. And that's pretty much the the simplest premise. And it kind of goes on from there. Not a lot to the story, right? It's not much of a plot, but I still felt like this was a really engaging movie, really delightful, lots of great imagery. And I thought it ended in a really satisfying way as well. So what did you think of the movie? 
one of the reasons I wanted to um, see an Iranian film was to kind of get a glimpse of the culture. And one thing I found interesting about this one, and all of them really, but is that... While I was going into the film wanting to see kind of all the differences in the society in terms of filmmaking and all that, what I found was that a really interesting thing, that, which I kind of already believed before, but this helped reinforce it, that the really, while there was obviously certain differences in terms of how they live, especially from you know in 1987 to now, and then other cultural differences and stuff like that, I was surprised by how kind of universal a lot of the stuff that they were showing was and the stuff they were talking about and how these kids were. So... Um, I guess is how accessible it would be to someone from uh, the West or in, you know anywhere else in the world. Very relatable, just in the sense that it's kind of a little kid who's misunderstood by adults. The adults don't take him seriously. And he's on this quest that nobody seems to understand the importance of, but for him it's like the all-important, morally right thing to do is to find his friend, give his notebook back, and make sure that he doesn't get in trouble with the teacher the next day. And so, you know, I would say a great personal risk to himself because A, he's going hungry, right? He's wandering all over the countryside at night with no supper yet. He hasn't had time to do his own homework and he knows he's gonna probably get in trouble with mom and dad when he gets home, but he's going on this little quest and I mean, he doesn't seem to be bothered so much by the fact that nobody knows where his friend lives. In fact, he runs around so much, like not to give, I don't know if there's really such a thing as spoilers for this movie because it's so simple, but you know, he runs back and forth between the two villages multiple times and never runs out of energy. So first of all, that's just proof that like little kids have boundless energy. Mm -hmm. They're basically, you know, batteries, but also, you know, just the fact that he encounters all these different obstacles and he doesn't give up. And I loved that persistence that he has. And we'll see some persistence come out in another of these films, which we'll talk about later. Some of the parallels that I felt like I saw to either other filmmakers or, you know, just other types of cinema. This reminded me a little bit of the Apu trilogy, specifically Pather Panchali. I think it's a little more lighthearted, certainly, than that film, but just the sense of, like, the adults not being super concerned with the kids other than how the kids can, like, help them keep their household, and the kids are kind of doing their own thing and sometimes getting into perilous situations. And, you know, also a little bit of, like, Italian neorealism, which I think was an influence, according to Abbas Kiristami, that was, you know, kind of a school of films that he watched when he was kind of in his formative years and those influence the types of movies he wanted to make where there's sort of like non-actors that are involved in the filmmaking and in some ways that lends almost more authenticity to the movie that you're making and also just that it's about like everyday life nothing crazy happens it's just the simple struggle of being alive in a lot of ways that yeah. makes it more relatable yeah that was something that was really nice about this film i think if but all three films really, in a sense, well, in a way, especially the, the second one, are dealing with bigger things to a certain degree and maybe more dramatic things. They're all pretty lighthearted in a sense, and they don't have huge stakes. So in a way, they're almost kind of relaxing, which might be good for people right now to kind of watch something that's kind of calming because there isn't huge, 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 you know, world-ending stakes, especially this one where, again, it's just him. I mean, the worst that's going to happen is the kid gets expelled from school if he doesn't get the notebook back. But it's not, nobody's going to die, no one's going to starve or anything. I thought this would be a great film to just put on when I'm going to bed because it is so relaxing. Aside from maybe the first 10 minutes where there's a lot of arguing with the teacher and the mom and there's babies crying. But the rest of it is very relaxing. I love the music, which it feels authentic to the film as well. Not that there's um, a lot of it. There's actually, there's very, there's, there's one... I mean, I think there's only one, in terms of non-diegetic and diegetic music, I think there's only one bit of score, and I think that's, as far as I can remember, I think that's the only bit of music in the movie, and they only play that, like, two, maybe three times in the movie. Right. It's the music that plays when he's running up the zigzag hill, right? Yeah. Yeah, which is an iconic image as well, and one that will recur in each of the movies. Oh, yeah, um, I, l I love when it recurs in the second film, briefly. Yeah, I was really excited. I was like, I've seen that hell before. I know where this is. Um, yeah, it's it just made me feel like I knew these characters, and I got to know this little boy. You know, he has very expressive eyes. I thought that, you know, even though these kid actors, clearly they probably never acted or been in a movie before, 
but they had very expressive eyes and really just great emotional intelligence, I guess you could say. They just brought something to the movie that you don't always see in a movie where it's adults acting their emotions. This is just like a little kid making split-second decisions, and you see how he feels just by looking at him because it's not a lot of dialogue. Yeah, and yeah, this one's probably the lightest in terms of dialogue. I think they get a bit more dialogue heavy as you move through the trilogy, especially the last one's pretty dialogue heavy. But um, yeah, I think the benefit to having non-professional actors at all, I think for for the most part, or I think entirely through this trilogy, is that especially for the kids, they really feel like kids. Because I think even like really good child actors, which I mean, there are a number of really good child actors who are experienced or you know, who have had a bit of experience or are just starting out, who seem maybe, you know, thinking about it maybe a bit too polished and a bit too rehearsed. And because these kids don't really know what they're doing in terms of acting, they're just kind of feeling their way through it. And, you know, I'm sure being helped by the director, you know, it just seems a bit more natural and they don't seem, it doesn't seem like they're acting. It just seems like they're being kids and going through the stuff as their characters naturally would. I also just liked the humor in this movie. Some of it is visual humor and some of it is more situational. But the first example I can think of is visual, right? Where he, the first person that Ahmed encounters when he gets over into the next village doesn't look like a person at all from our perspective. We just see these bushes moving along and it looks almost like um, something out of Labyrinth or something. Like it, it looks like a bush is walking and the little boy goes and asks the bush a question and it turns out the guy turns around and it's a guy that's like carrying these things on his back but the visual of that just makes it have almost a fairy tale like quality and i love that and then there's another kind of visual gag where he thinks he's found his friend but you don't see the kid's face for a while because first he's carrying shutters out of a door and you just see the bottom half of him and then he's standing behind a horse talking to his dad And then he finally emerges and we're like, we need to see who this is already. But I love how it kind of like builds suspense through the tiniest things like that. Other little moments that I liked, (laughs) there's this conversation that's both terrible and hilarious. These old men that are sitting around Coker and they see Ahmed running around doing his thing and they start commenting on how like he needs to be disciplined and he's, you know, too independent and The one old man says, you know, when I was young, my father gave me uh, an allowance of, I think it's like one penny every other week and a spanking every week. And, you know, that's what raised me right. He sometimes forgot the allowance, but he never forgot the spanking. And I was just like, it doesn't even say spanking, it just says beating. So we don't even know how he was. Yeah. And yeah, then then the the guy he's talking to says, oh, well, what happens if the main kid in the movie, what if he doesn't, you know, do anything a particular week and then the the grandfather of the kids like well we just you know then, then you just find a reason to beat them anyway yeah. so they don't forget and, and it's just it's yeah it's very <laughs> kind of interesting especially since uh the guy back pauses for a second so i don't think he's even really thought too much about like you know what happens if they don't actually do anything so i think he's just right. kind of making the stuff up as he goes along because he doesn't really he's just used to it. he hasn't actually thought deeply about this practice and whether right. it's good or not Yeah, it's just an interesting kind of look into the generational differences there, too. And that moment just stood out to me. Uh, Of course, it does not deter Ahmed. He keeps doing his thing. So, and he doesn't get beaten in the movie, so I'm very thankful for that. No, no, again, yeah, there's nothing, again, there's nothing terribly dramatic or violent in these films. Well, sort of in the second one, but not really. So yeah, I really loved it. I thought it was a great introduction to the trilogy. And also, if you're looking for a place to start with Kiristami, I think this would be a really great place to start just because of its simplicity. It's very accessible. And as we go along, we'll talk about some of the other elements that get added into his films. But this is the only one that doesn't really have sort of like a meta narrative on yeah. top of the regular narrative. So yeah, if well... you're looking for more straightforward films, this is one to start with. Yeah, it is. It's very simple, and it's like all these films. It's uh, I guess so, subtly beautiful, in a sense. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's. I mean, his style is very, 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 very simple. But um, he gets. I mean, the cinematography can be gorgeous in these films too. But this, the beyond the look of it being subtly beautiful, just the films in general are kind of just are, are that way too. Did you feel a little bit like? I mean, this film's pretty short. It's an hour and 23 minutes or so. Mm-hmm. Did you feel at all of that? Because I felt 
that it could have been a bit shorter because I did feel it was dragging a bit in certain places where not a lot was happening. I mean, not a lot happens in the movie in general, but I can maybe put up with that a little bit more if it was maybe 70-something minutes as opposed to 80-something minutes. I don't think from a story perspective it needs to be 80 minutes, but I think from a character perspective and just kind of what Kiristami's exploring in the movie, the runtime worked for me Mm -hmm. because he does have an encounter with an older gentleman who makes doors um, or used to make doors for people. And he says, I made a door for everybody in the village. I know everyone. And he's quite old. He's walking like with a cane, I believe, and he's like hunched over. And he is the only one that really like goes out of his way to try to help Ahmed find his friend, albeit not necessarily in a super successful way. They take their time. They dilly dally quite a bit, but I liked that because it was really the only adult character that seemed to be empathetic to Ahmed. And really they both kind of seem like people that are going against the flow perhaps of the rest of society. The older man is seeing people, you know, replace the beautiful wooden doors he made with, steel doors and he says I don't know what the point of that is and kind of goes on and you know he's sort of mumbling but sort of also reminiscing about a time that's that's no longer there and how the world is changing and I don't think that Ahmed cares one iota what he's saying but I enjoyed seeing them kind of talk past each other because it was just a good example of how it didn't really matter about their age like both of them kind of were questing after something that couldn't be or that nobody else saw the significance of so I liked those little kind of anachronistic moments and moments that took a journey elsewhere. And then uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because there does seem to be a door theme in this film with that starts with a shot of a door and then you have the guy talking about doors and near the end when the kid's back at home, the door blows open and uh, it does does seem to be a recurring door thing. I mean, what did, did you make much of that or what did you think of that? I noticed that too. I don't quite know what to make of it, but I liked it and it made me want to go back and see this movie again. Actually, I would say as soon as I finished watching it and I watched a couple of the special features, I wanted to put the movie on again and watch it, which I haven't done yet because I was watching the other movies in the trilogy. But yeah, I do want to pursue that more and kind of understand what the doors Mm -hmm. maybe me yeah i don't know if it's something as simple as just you know closed and open metaphorical doors in society or something like that but or in terms of generations or adults and kids and stuff but yeah no i would be interested to kind of see that again with thinking about the door stuff more because it is kind of a unique thing i haven't seen somebody use a door for that like a running theme before so i'd be interested to see that more so yeah, this one was a great start to the trilogy for me. I gave it five stars on Letterboxd, and I couldn't wait to see what the next couple movies would bring. So how about you? Was this something that made you excited to see the next films, or were you kind of like, oh no, I have to watch more? <laughs> um, I You liked it much more than I did. I liked it. Okay. Um, I gave it like three stars, which is not a like horrible thing. It was just, it, again, it was dra- I liked it, but... And I found certain things interesting about it. And I love the voice of it. I just thought, while reading more of it in post, I could kind of see more of what he was trying to say with the film in terms of, I know that I think he was trying to say stuff about everyday heroics and stuff like that, which I think is fine. And I might go into the film with that in mind and like it more. But I still think for me, it just drags a bit too much. And it's just kind of like we can get a little bit of a move on just a little bit. So I did rate it lower than that. But I still um, was excited to see more of it because, again, I liked the, the vo- his voice was something really intriguing to me. And um, you kind of come out of his film being very positive. So um, I was excited to see more of it. And I did watch the next film right after this one. But yeah, no. So I liked it. You liked it more than I did, but I was certainly excited to see more of the trilogy. Okay, and the next film in the trilogy is a film that's called On the Box Set Anyway, and Life Goes On. Um, It has also been called Life and Nothing More, and on the poster, or at least one of them anyway, uh, one of the English language posters, it's Life and Nothing More, in parentheses, and Life Goes On. So you can call it what you want. I will probably call it And Life Goes On, because that's what I'm used to, and that's the title. Um, 
I prefer and like more. But anyway, it was a film, it was made in 1992, so five years after um, the first film. And this film is a bit different than the first film, and Where's the Friend's House, in uh, some, a few ways. One of which is, uh, in terms of Baxter and real-world events, um, again, this came out in 1992, in 1990, there was a, it looks to be like a pretty bad earthquake across Iran that did a lot of damage to residences and cities and industries, um, especially the smaller ta- places like uh, villages like Coker, which are don't have like up to, you know, really strong concrete, steel, all the stuff, foundations. So um, it devastated a lot of different things. So the story of it, again, very, very simple, is a director. And by the way, this is partially based off true events where Abbas Kiristami, after this earthquake happened, uh, tried to travel to Coker to just check on, I guess, maybe not just the child, some of the child actors, but the adult actors as well, to kind of see if they were still alive they were okay and safe and all that stuff so this is kind of a fictionalized telling of that where a guy who is not called Abbas Kiristami at all in the film but he's a director who um, is with his son and I think they have nothing to do with where is the friend's house which is a film within this film but they just want to see if these kids are okay because they like the film so they're going to go see if these kids are okay so they're traveling across iran to get to uh coker and there's a lot of obstacles in their way because of the um earthquake you know closed off a lot of roads traffic is terrible and people are cleaning up debris and uh, there's just a lot of obstacles in their way but they're determined to kind of get to coker and check on these kids so while the first film was very you know it kept to the kind of fourth wall thing that you films usually go by this film st- starts the trilogy off with kind of breaking that down a bit where again where the where is the friend's house is a film you know in this movie and it does do some other things that kind of break down the fourth wall a little bit too which we'll probably uh, get into a little bit later but I maybe mean, before we get into well i guess like i said what's to start off with that um what um did you think of that kind of uh, beginning of kind of breaking down the fourth wall and were you expecting it and just kind of how did you react to that so when i first watched this movie um right after i'd watched where is the friend's house because Where's the Friends House had been very straightforward, I wasn't necessarily expecting this meta aspect. But in other Kiristami films, like Close Up, he definitely blends like documentary and narrative. So I started to get that sense about five or ten minutes in. And then, of course, when he shows the picture of the star of Where's the Friends House, I was like, oh, okay, we're doing this kind of movie. So I sort of recalibrated a little. Because it is something I, he likes to do. He likes to mess with that stuff absolutely. in his films. Yeah, he definitely does. This may be one of the earliest examples of that, but he definitely has done that in other films. So, yeah, I liked it. I thought it was an interesting approach. And I was not familiar with this earthquake, but, you know, in reading about it, it killed like 50,000 people, which is horrific. So imagine, you know, going through an area that's experienced that and ostensibly only a few days later, I don't know how much later in the real world he went there, but in the movie, it seems that it's been maybe a week or two. And, you know, he's just talking to people or his stand-in is talking to people and asking them questions and they've lost people and they've lost their homes. And, in some ways, it almost feels a little like impertinent to be even asking these questions or to be concerned only about like the stars of his movie when everybody in this area has lost so much. But people seem to be generally willing to talk to him, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, and it kind of puts a light on because I didn't even really realize at the time in the first film how much of those kids were just local actors or local just people that he made into actors. And you kind of see you, that he hammers that home with this one and with the next one how he's really just using uh, whoever he can find that he thinks will work and that can do the job that he wants them to do. But yeah, I mean, there's an openness, which I don't know if that's a part of Iranian society where you can kind of talk to more freely about that sort of stuff and kind of in the middle of uh, rebuilding and cleaning up and dealing with, you know, the loss of loved ones and stuff. But yeah, it was kind of nice to kind of see this kind of openness and not a lot of resistance um, in that regard. I was reading afterwards, I was reading some of uh, his own like quotations about making the movie. And he said, basically, for the survivors, it was like they'd been reborn, having experienced death around them. The earthquake happened at four or five in the morning. So in a sense, everybody could have been dead. And it was almost accidental that they hadn't died. 
So I didn't just see myself as a film director, but also as an observer of the people who had been condemned to death. And this was a very big influence on me. The issue of life and death from then on does recur in my films. So that was his version of events um, that he had, you know, really seen people at this critical moment and he was capturing their real reactions to this insane mm -hmm. event. Yeah. And I don't know if all the people that are in it were experiencing, if they're telling all telling maybe slightly scripted or rehearsed versions of their personal stories or if he's taking finding people in the area who can tell the stories of other people he's met i don't know exactly how that worked but yeah that's a running kind of thing in the film is this kind of idea of these people will are going to enjoy life appreciate life much more because of this near-death thing and there are some characters who get married just early because it's like you know we can we could die the next earthquake we could be the ones that die so let's just get married and let's do this or let's do that and stuff and just you know cherishing life uh, much much more than they did before and i liked that there was still even though this is a serious event and this horrible tragedy there was not really a sense of the macabre it was really more joyful it really was more focused on the positive aspects of life and i guess that kind of speaks to the title right of that life goes on but I liked, I liked how even little moments like um, the director's son in the movie is trying to find a soft drink. And, you know, some people are like, how can you ask for, you know, a Coke right now? Like there's worse things happening, but he's just on his little journey to get a drink. And, you know, he asks all these people who are like cleaning up the rubble of their shops if they have soft drinks available and he eventually does find them. He has a moment where he's like, playing with a grasshopper that he caught when he got up out of the car to use the bathroom and you know his dad is like no you've got to let that thing out but the kid is like no I want to keep it and raise it so that it can emigrate and it just like all these little funny moments and a lot of it comes out of the mouth of this kid which once again like I feel here's Tommy does a great job of finding kids who can share things that may be sounding would sound corny coming out of an adult's mouth but like from a kid it just sounds simple and beautiful and the kid can get away with saying things to a lady that lost most of her family like oh i wish everybody died and just came back to life because then they would appreciate life more so he gets away with saying stuff like that that or, might have been things that curious tommy was thinking yeah or uh he says to a lady who's lost her young daughter well you know it's probably good that she died because now she won't have to do homework yeah <laughs> <laughs> Which is a horrible thing to say to somebody. And I think in some cases, I don't know, again, I don't know if in Iranian society people just kind of accept that stuff in terms of being polite or if it's just a matter of the director and the actors. The actors not being able to emote stuff on cue as much and the director just not wanting to go there. But, you know, some, some some cases I do think maybe they could be a little bit more upset or a little bit more annoyed by some of these things than they are instead of just kind of accepting them or kind of talking about this death stuff and stuff in such an offhanded way but at the same time especially with the kid when he's you know talking about you know wants to talk to a kid who's lost uh, his uncle talking to him about the recent world cup soccer one of the soccer games that or football games whatever that was televised and stuff and then talking you know about the homework thing it's i mean because again he's like i don't know maybe early double digits or younger so i mean he's not really going to understand all this stuff that's going on around it, especially since he didn't seem to be in an area that was heavily affected by the earthquake. So he's not really going to understand this. And he's, you know, like 10 or younger. So he's going to ask, you know, stuff without a filter. So it just makes it a bit that much more realistic because you have a kid who doesn't really understand what's going on and will ask in sensitive, off topic things. No, I think that kid was the highlight of the movie for me. Although I also liked the old man who was actually supposedly the same old man that we saw in Where's the Friend's House, who's like, oh yeah, I guess I remember you to the director, like, even though if they really worked together, I would think they would recognize Yeah, that was a bit confusing, okay. again, because I don't know if this director is supposed to be the person who directed Where the, Where's the Friend's House, or if he's just another director who just liked the film. It was kind of confusing to me mm -hmm. in that regard, because in some cases it seems like, cause he does meet at least three people, uh, I know two of the kids from the film, not the main kid, because that's one of the... I don't think you ever actually see him, even though they're primarily looking for him. You see some of the other kids who are obviously older, playing themselves in quotation marks, and then you meet the old... I think it's the same actor who was in the first film who played the old man who made the doors. But it's kind of confusing, like, none of these people... If he is the person who, in this fictional world, directed Where's the Friend's House, nobody seems to recognize him or really acknowledge the fact that he directed it. So it's a little confusing. 
Yeah, I couldn't tell if that was just my confusion or if it was the attempt to blur that line between documentary, fiction, meta. Like, there's the old man talks about, oh, you made me look older in the movie, and I thought art should make me look younger. That's like the true art, and I don't really have a hump back, and I'm not really that old, and that wasn't even really my house. And then they go to a house that's supposed to be his house in this movie, and he's like, <laughs> oh, this isn't my house either. It's my movie <laughs> house, yeah. And that was house. like even more of a, like, in the sense of the film, like the fiction of the film can kind of work as in, I'm just using this as my house right now, even though it's not mine, but it's also this great, yeah, fourth wall breaking. This isn't really my house either because we're still doing a movie, which was wonderful. And I swear there was one point where I can't tell if it's a character in the film or that's saying this, but you hear a line off camera, which I cannot tell if it's somebody talking to the old man or if it's actually right after he tells this thing about this is my movie house and all this stuff, if it's supposed to be Abbas Kiristami talking behind the camera, giving him like, hey, the water jug's over there or something. It was kind of hard for me to tell, but it was kind of even a better kind of fourth wall breaking thing. Yeah, I took that as the director giving him instructions of where he was supposed to be in the shot or where to find the prop, which I think becomes a little more explicit and clear in the next movie, which I'm sure oh, we'll God. talk about more. Yeah. Um, but that's how I took it. There were also some just other fun visual moments in this, not just fun, but like beautiful I know that the earthquake was devastating and horrible, so I'm not saying that that's beautiful, but there were some gorgeous shots from far away of these deep fissures in the hillside that even, you know, from far away, like, you can tell how fractured this world has become because of the earthquake, but I think that also sort of stands in for the fracturing of, you know, that line again between truth and fiction, the line between a more modern society that the director and his son are coming from in Tehran and the people that are living with this every day, like the little boy asking, well, did you watch the soccer match? And the other kid is like, well, no, our TV was like, you know, smashed because of the earthquake. And the little kid like cannot get it through his head why your TV was so broken that you wouldn't watch the soccer game. I think some of those visuals really kind of portrayed that disconnect really well. And then there's another great moment where the, the little kid is searching through the rubble and he finds the ceramic rooster that's broken. And then off camera, you hear a real rooster crowing. And it's just a nice little symmetry. I, I think that was a great moment. I don't know the significance, but I liked it. It's kind of a nice balance of it. It's this kind of weird thing that he makes work where he's it's showing, you know, obviously a lot of tragedy and sorrow and it's kind of suffering. But he's doing it in this, again, it's the, you know, we appreciate life much more so. He's finding these beautiful things in kind of horrible tragedies and horrible pain, which is wonderful, and both, both in terms of visual kind of cinematography type stuff, just in terms of his shots, and then in terms of just in terms of what the characters are going through and what they're describing, and just the, the kind of mood of the movie. It doesn't make, well, at least me anyway, it didn't make me feel sad. It actually gave me some hopefulness. And again, in a very subtle way, it just made me feel kind of good and nice and gave me a nice little boost yeah again it's a movie maybe a little less so than the previous one or even the following but but it, it's a movie i could see just putting on to relax to and feel good about you don't have to think super hard you can just sort of absorb it in little bits and pieces i really like this film a lot in terms of star rating or whatever i gave this one a four um, so I liked it quite a bit, and it does talk about, and slightly more serious topics again about, you know, the earthquake and then kind of life and death and uh, all that, but in a very kind of beautiful, easy to digest, non-depressing fashion. So I liked this one a bit less. Um, you mentioned the first one dragging. To me, this one dragged quite a bit, and that's probably on me, but um, my attention span just wasn't there for it. So I felt a little bit less interested in this one. I liked what was going on, but I just felt like I got the point after a while. But I do want to go back to it now that I've seen all three because of the connections between this one and the, the next one. And maybe that'll give me a greater appreciation for it. But for me, this was my least favorite of the trilogy. So the final film in the Coker trilogy was made in 1994, and it's called Through the Olive Trees. I think this is the only one of the three that doesn't have multiple titles, if I'm correct. 
I don't know quite why this is. But yeah, this one is, I, I would say, by far the most meta. Yeah. And yeah. Um, certainly necessary, I think, to watch the first two before you watch the third one. And especially, Otherwise, the, especially the second one, yeah. Correct. You would need to see life and nothing more to truly appreciate through the olive trees, I think. Otherwise, you're going to be a bit lost. But in this film, we find you have not one, but two stand-ins now for the director, Abbas Kiarostami. Essentially, this movie is meant to be a documentary about the filming of In Life Goes On. And so you have a guy playing the director from In Life Goes On, and then you have another guy playing the guy that's directing the well, it's director. So it's definitely adding several layers now. And again, this movie takes us through a fictionalized, but a version of the production of uh, Life and Nothing More or And Life Goes On, where you see them casting, you see a production person, a producer uh, woman who is trying to get everybody to cooperate and do their jobs. You see them on the set. You see them do take after take of this one pivotal scene in the previous movie. And so it's definitely a lot more meta, but also in a way a little more straightforward in terms of following what's going on than I think the previous one. It's a little bit more of a narrative. It starts with something that's very documentary-like. I mean, it looks a bit different in terms of the lighting. And it feels, I don't know, again, it's hard to tell, especially with this film, how much of it is not scripted and how much of it is scripted, especially the beginning. I don't know if it was still kind of a stage thing where it's like, you, you know, say this here, say this here, we're going to do this and that, or if it really was just kind of, Abbas Kirsami shooting his stand-in, doing, interacting with these locals and casting them. And then after that point, it gets, it's a little bit more filmic because it's sort of documentary, like, oh, in a way, but there's still, it's not really documentary because it's still filming some stuff. Like, there's some stuff they're filming that you wouldn't be filming for a documentary. Like, it's very obvious they're not actually being followed by cameras in this. So it's not quite like, you know, this is Spinal Tap type of thing. So it's this weird kind of mixture of styles and fiction and nonfiction. Because the main kind of cruxes of it is that you are you're following the people who uh in and life goes on there's a scene where the stand-in director for that film is talking with a newlywed man whose wife is upstairs about you know they just lost their family and they just got recently got married and all this stuff and you're kind of following the actors who are doing that scene and their personal troubles about this guy who wants to marry his pretend wife um but is her grandmother won't let him because he doesn't have a house and you know you can't he's not you know he's a he's illiterate and stuff like that so that's the kind of main fictional plot of the film and did you because i think these are different actors who who played the newlywed couple in not that you really see the wife and and life goes on but i think there are different actors i was a bit frustrated that they didn't get the same people for that was that a problem at all for you it wasn't in fact i want to go back and double check because i don't remember specifically if the guy that plays hussein hussein is the same one or not but they kind of speak to that a little bit in this movie because the producer is saying, oh, the girl won't talk to the boy because they have this, you know, kind of like personal thing going on. So we might have to recast one or both parts. And in fact, you can see in the beginning, they're filming the scene with one male actor and that guy is super shy around women. And so he has like a stammering problem and he basically can't say his lines when he's actually asked to say them on camera because there's a woman present. Um, so then they recast it supposedly with this other guy named Hussein who really supposedly in the world of the movie in real life does want to marry the actress that's playing the girl. And, um, yeah, I, it didn't really bother me that it was played by different people because I still feel like the crux of the story was the same. And I was torn between whether I find the character of Hussein like a hopeless romantic or kind of stalkery. Yeah, I was But getting... I loved it anyway. <laughs> I don't know. We can talk about that. Well, I I mean, it is nowhere near... I mean, people remember our uh, Erner Jalubich episode. It is nowhere near as bad as the guy was in Monte Carlo, but uh, <laughs> nowhere near that bad or creepy. But... Again, and I don't know if this is some sort of built-in stubbornness with Iranians and specifically, but he is just like, I would have given up way before this guy did. And not in a, you know, I'm not romantic or I don't love this person, but it's like, it just seems to me like she's very obviously doesn't want, it's not even just like, you know, she's pressured from her grandmother. It just seems like she generally just does not want to be with this guy. And he keeps on going with it to a point where I just kind of lost like a little bit of that is fine but after a certain point it was just like 
Okay, you're being a little bit of a stalker here, dude. Just leave her the hell alone. How, I mean, are you going to take no for an answer at any points? I mean, you even say if you turn the page or something, then I know that's a yes. If you don't, then I know that's a no or whatever. And that she doesn't turn the page, so he knows it's a no. But he still then bothers her and stuff. So that did hurt the film a bit for me um, in terms of it just felt I don't know how much by the end of it I didn't know how much I really wanted to support this guy and his endeavors to kind of woo this woman because he just again was kind of veering and he was kind of going to that stalker like territory so I felt like in the world of the movie I think we're supposed to root for him and Mm -hmm. I think I was trying to set aside my own like cultural baggage I guess of what's expected in romance because I don't necessarily know what was expected in that time period in that area in Iran. I I am assuming that their dating conventions are perhaps a bit different than ours, or at least certainly were at at this time, so I think I was willing to forgive a little bit more. But basically the story that Hussein tells the director in this movie is, well, I was working as a mason and I saw this girl that was really beautiful and that I, you know, wanted to marry and so I talked to her mom and her mom didn't really want me to talk to her and seemed annoyed. And then I got fired from my masonry job because the woman like asked, asked that I get fired. And then the next day the earthquake happened, this girl's parents died. And then he kept going to the grave site during the morning period to try to see her and try to talk to her grandparents about marrying her. So he says that at some point when he was seeing her at the graveyard, she gave him a look that made him think she was interested. But grandma was anti because she said, you know, he said, give me two good reasons why I shouldn't marry your granddaughter. And she says, number one, you're illiterate. Number two, you have no house, which like that seems legit to me. But, you know, I guess we've also seen like period romances before. I'm thinking of, you know, stuff from Jane Austen where. People are supposedly not suited for each other that end up together and they're defying cultural rules or whatever. So I guess I sort of can sympathize a little bit with his point of view. I think in that culture, it seemed that at least to me, it seemed that the women don't necessarily speak out for themselves when it comes to their suitors, or at least that was an evolving norm at the time. So I was willing to forgive a little bit more. And he did have some sweet things to say when they were between mm-hmm. filming scenes. He does talk about, in terms of the not suitable thing, he does talk about, we have some good points too, about, well, you know, why would we both have a house? Then we're we going to live in both houses. Are we going to mm-hmm. get rid of one of them? Or, you know, I don't think, you know, that poor people should marry, just necessarily marry just poor people, and rich people, rich people, then literate people, and literate people. If I marry an illiterate person, who's going to help my kid, our kid, with their homework and stuff? And so he makes up some good points, too. And, you know, it's like, you know, if we get married, of course I'll get us a house, and I'll build, or I'll build us a house, or I'll do whatever I can to support us, and all this stuff. So um, he does seem willing to do that stuff, but at the same time, it seems like he doesn't see much point of it if he's not actually married. Like, why get a house if he's not married? And all that stuff. So um, he kind of has some good, nice counter arguments to some of that. And even though she does seem to be ignoring him, it is hard to tell what she's necessarily thinking. Like maybe she is just playing hard to get, or maybe she just doesn't know what to think of this guy. You know, she's, she's trying to do her homework while he's giving her these long soliloquies. Like when we get married, sometimes I'll serve the tea. Sometimes you'll serve the tea. That'll just be how it is. You know, that's how I see marriage. And he talks about how he won't yell at her and he'll find his own places to put his socks. He won't expect her to do his laundry and all this stuff. So he comes across as at least trying to embrace modern ideas of romance, even if he's going about it in kind of a boneheaded way at times. So for me, this one, you said this last one, When Life Goes On, was your least favorite. This was probably my least favorite just because of, again, it was harder for me to kind of get behind the main guy. And this one really did kind of drag for me a lot. Again, there was some of that still theme of appreciating life more because of, you know, after tragedy and all this stuff. But it wasn't as strong or as well told as the second film for me. And it just, I don't know, it was much harder for me to kind of care about the stuff going on in this movie. And it seemed more just highlighting kind of meta filmmaking than highlighting kind of good ideas or talking about important things to me. So it just, yeah, it really dragged for me. And again, it just seemed more kind of experimental filmmaking than anything else. So I actually think I liked this one the most. Mm Mm-hmm. But I will say, I think it depends, your enjoyment definitely depends on whether you find Hussein to be a character you want to root for or not. Um, But even setting him aside, I think there are some really great insights into filmmaking here and that 
uh, Kiristami is kind of letting you peek behind the curtain a bit. For example, there's a line that the director in this movie wants Hussein to say where he wants him to say he lost 65 relatives in the earthquake. And Hussein's like, no, I only lost 25 people. But the, the director is insistent, like, you have to say it was 65. And so there's a bit of an argument back and forth. And I thought that was an interesting thing to capture because it kind of highlights how potentially filmmaking does lean into the the misery a bit more or can exaggerate certain things for effect and is even the most quote unquote like neorealistic filmmaking might still be telling us things that aren't true mm -hmm. that we can't necessarily trust it so I liked that I liked some of the cultural things that seem to be going on too because there's a bit in the beginning where the girl that they've cast as the lead actress really wants to wear a fancy dress that she's borrowed from her friend and the producer is insistent. No, you're going to wear a peasant dress. You're going to wear a peasant dress. Wear the one that your grandma's wearing. And the girl's like, no, people don't wear that anymore. Like, that's not something that's really done. And the producer is like, basically doesn't care. Like, you've got to dress this way, you know. And the girl's like, well, that's just going to make me look poor. And, you know, the producers of the film don't seem to care. And later we see another scene where they have to do take after take because this girl won't address her husband as mister she just keeps calling him by his first name and finally the other actor in the scene is like you know girls don't always or women don't always call their husbands mister anymore in this part of the country so it wouldn't be inauthentic for her to just call me by my first name but it takes a while for them to really convince the director to do that and i thought again that's a glimpse into or maybe a commentary on how sometimes filmmaking about people in these conditions can tend to otherize or glamorize the the things that are so different from quote unquote modern society and how even though you're trying to portray these people in the world that they live it might still be showing the wrong things or it might still not get those details right and the, i liked that bit as well yeah it might be leaning too much into stereotype even if you're dealing with Maybe people or classes that you should be familiar with, and maybe are familiar with, you're still maybe even unintentionally leaning into the stereotype of society and how they view uh, those people. So yeah, that was, that was interesting. Also, his you kind of see maybe a bit of Abbas Kiarostami's kind of approach to at least in terms of these non-trained, you know, this local people he's using as actors. Uh, where I forget the exact quotes and the exact context, but at one point somebody is like, "Oh, do you want to be in the film?" It's like, "Well, I'm not really an actor." And he's like, oh, it's okay, acting's easy. And you can kind of, well, yes, that's very kind of an over oversimplification of what certain actors have to do. Um, you kind of can kind of tell how he approaches acting, or approaches actors and just kind of very gently kind of gets them to do kind of what he wants without a lot of, um, especially when they, sh when they shoot certain scenes again and again and again, because he is very off-handed, easy approach to kind of just dealing with actors and getting them to do what he wants and just say the lines the way he wants. And almost seems like he probably partially gets around that by just hiring actors who will naturally just do uh say the lines the way he wants without having to uh try very hard so you kind of get a behind the scenes look at how he is as a director too which is interesting another thing i liked about this movie is that we do find out that the two boys from the first film are okay and are alive and well because they do pop up in this movie um to very little fanfare i noticed well i don't know because in the and life goes on. They're specifically looking for some of the kids in the in that were in that movie. And uh, where is the friend's house? Which again, they do mention in the third film. And they do specifically meet a couple of them. And one of the kids, who, uh, one of the boys' sisters, sister who wasn't in the first film. And um, those are specifically supposed to be the actors who were playing characters in Where Is the Friend's House. And this one, you see, well, one of the kids might might have still seen in, in Life Goes On. I can't remember. But then one of them is the main the actor who played the main kid in Where's the Friend's House. But I don't know if they're supposed to be themselves or just other villagers or whatever in that area. Because, yeah, they don't really mention it. And, again, they are technically too old at that point to be themselves anymore because it's still supposed to be 1990 or 91 or something, even though this came out in 94. So, yeah, those young kids you're seeing kind of watching the filming, I don't know. They're the same actors, but I don't know if they're supposed to be playing themselves. It's a bit unclear, I think. Yeah, it is a little bit unclear, but I was still happy to see them. Just no. I was happy to see that, you know, zigzagging hill towards the end, too. Um, no, yeah, no, because especially um, when I was watching... The second film, I specifically didn't look up to see if the kid who played the, the the actor who played the main kid in the first film, if he did die in the earthquake, because I was kind of 
to get wrapped up in the film a bit more. So to kind of figure out that, oh, he did actually live and he was fine, and or at least as fine as you can be after something like that, was very nice. So I was ha- very happy to see him, whether or not he was playing himself or not. But go back to that hill thing, though. There was a... And, uh, I can't remember. I know I saw it in this film, the recurring guy, somebody running up a hill thing in the third film. I can't remember where it was or what the looked like or anything. But in the second film, you do see when the the director and the kid in the second film are driving to you know just driving along a road and they're kind of just looking at the scenery. And at one point, you just very briefly see this person who almost looks like a kid, so just running in the same exact way up a hill, the same hill or a similar hill that the kid does in the first film. And again, it's just a very poetic, kind of beautiful uh, callback that I, you know, possibly is my favorite shot in the film, in that film. Yeah, it was one of my favorites as well. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the ending of this movie. I think people need to discover it for themselves. But I loved the way that this movie ended. I think some people have a different read on it than others, but I loved it. It just seemed like the perfect way to, to cap off not only this trilogy, but, you know, this kind of, look into Iranian life and Iranian life in this specific village. Really beautiful from a filmmaking perspective and a character perspective, I think. I was reading that that Abbas Kiristami didn't, I don't necessarily think he hated it, but that he was not uh, a huge supporter of calling these films a trilogy. And they said that at least for the f- relation to the first, second, the first film relation to the other two, it was more just kind of a similarity of place that they just happened to be taking place in and around Coker and that he thought that in terms of theme that Taste of Cherry would be better at which he made Taste of Cherry he made right after uh, through the uh, olive trees that that would be a better uh, third f- film after and life goes on and through the olive trees because it's also dealing with kind of appreciating life more after death or after a near death thing or whatever and I can kind of see that because uh, where's the friend's house where again it has again obviously a certain similar style and it takes place in or around Coker it doesn't really share the same themes of life and appreciating life as the other two films are. So it deals with other things like, again, everyday heroics and all that. So uh, I kind of understand what he means, even though I think, for me, I really think you should watch, if you're going to watch any of these, if you're going to watch the second and third films, you really should be watching Where is the Friend's House? Um, Because you get appreciation for all the the second and third films more if you watch the ones that came um, before it, but again, I see where he's talking about with the theme thing. So, what did you, um, what do you think of that? Do you think these work better as a trilogy, or that um, I can't remember if you've watched Chase of Cherry? If Chase of Cherry would be a better kind of thing to replace, where's the friend's house? I have not seen Taste of Cherry. Um, my understanding of the story doesn't sound like initially that it ties to these, but maybe it does. I do want to watch it. I. I don't care what he says. These go together. You have to see them in this order. I think you can watch Where's the Friend's House on its own and Mm. maybe not see the other two. But if you're going to watch the other two, you would definitely want to do them in this chronological order. Um, So I don't know. I mean, I think filmmakers are going to classify themselves however they feel like. And we've seen that before with others. I think it makes sense to, to watch these in order. Yeah, I really do think it does, too. And especially since just in a subtle way, too, beyond the, you know, and Life Goes On and Through the Olive Trees, referencing Where's the Friend's House as a movie, and it helps if you've seen that movie to kind of understand the references and who these kids are and stuff like that. Just watching and Life Goes On and seeing the devastation of this earthquake, I was much more invested in him getting to Coker and seeing what happened to Coker and the people there because I had watched Where's the Friend's House and gotten invested in this village in this area of Iran and I think I would have felt much less emotionally invested if I hadn't seen that film first. Right. I completely agree. I think you have to have that foundational understanding of what that place and what those people were like before you can really relate fully to the the next two movies in the trilogy. So before you had seen this trilogy, how many of his films had you seen again? Let's see. I seen I think the first one I saw was um, certified copy, which is fantastic. Definitely track that down. Um, also has a little bit of meta thing going on. And then the next one I watched was like someone in love, which I believe was one of his last two films. Maybe his last film was 24 frames, but I think this might've been his next to last one. And it took place in, um, I believe Japan. And then, um, I also watched close up. So that's probably his best known, and it is another one where it mixes like documentary and narrative. 
about a guy who's impersonating another Iranian filmmaker. And that guy really did exist and really did do that. So it's about him and about the trial and super interesting. I would definitely recommend it. Um, but those films are very different from these three, just in the sense that they're a bit more complex. And I think these are a little bit more straightforward. I know you're already a fan of his work. Did this get you, these movies get you even more kind of excited to see more of his stuff? They did. And it also made me want to revisit the ones I've already watched just to, you know, kind of get more context. I think I was a little nervous about watching his movies initially because I'd heard that, oh, they're really meta. They're very experimental. And I can see that being alienating for people. But I think if you go into it with an open mind and don't think about what this means for filmmaking, but just kind of watch them on a human level, you'll get more out of it. Even if you don't make it all the way through the trilogy, maybe you just watch the first one. I was looking up afterwards, after I watched these three, I was looking up some interviews with Abbas Kiristami, and there's one on YouTube that I found where he actually kind of has something interesting to say that I, I think is relevant to people maybe watching his movies for the first time. So he says that he likes movies that put you to sleep in the theater. He doesn't like movies that disturb you. Um, and he said, some films have made me doze off in the theater, but the same films have kept me up at night thinking about them, woke me up in the morning thinking about them, and kept me thinking about them for the next few weeks. Those are the kind of films I like. So I want to kind of hear your perspective on that, right? The idea that these are films you could like fall asleep to, maybe not a lot goes on in them, but you can't stop thinking about them. Do you think his movies live up to that for you so far? Um. I see what he means. I don't know necessarily if a movie should make you fall asleep, but um, yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with, with what he's saying, I think, even though if I don't know quite what he's getting at in certain respects. But again, I don't know. I think it might go back to something I was saying earlier where he's finding a way to talk about certain, I mean, especially if uh, in life goes on, talking about a very serious thing, tragedy, he's finding a way to make it very accessible. So in that sense, it's not, like you said, it could be put on the background and it doesn't really disturb you kind of emotionally or just kind of in a viewing sense. It just kind of flows in you and while you're watching it. So in that sense, I think it really works. His films really work because, again, they are just highly, highly accessible. And maybe that's kind of what he means, that it doesn't jar people while they're watching. Even his experimental stuff doesn't really jar you. It just feels natural and uh, fine. So... You know, I think I understand what he's saying. I sort of agree with that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like horror movies. I like action movies. I like movies with a lot of twists and turns. So I don't agree with him necessarily that I don't want a movie to disturb me. I no. love it when a movie disturbs me, but I think there's a place for both kinds of movies. And, mm -hmm. you know, no, this isn't Gaspar Noe, right? Like, it's not going to, like, keep you up at night necessarily. But I do think as simple as it seems it's gonna stick with you and he in that same interview he said he doesn't think of himself as a storyteller which i also found interesting because i think most filmmakers do think of themselves as storytellers but he talked about how his movies focus more on characters and i think it's enlightening that he also was a photographer he also was a poet like he released a book of poems and so I think the way that he viewed the world was through that really specific lens that's not necessarily focused on narrative. It's more focused on capturing moments in time or, you know. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, in terms of photographer, it seems like it would be more just capturing people doing their thing and not really, again, maybe in terms of his, his approach to directing, just letting people do their thing and it's not really getting too involved in it and within that you can kind of create more real situations and just and find more truth in uh, people and in, in terms of you know micromanaging things and really focusing on telling the story and stuff instead of just kind of letting the camera capture what it, it does well either way i definitely think people should check these movies out i'd love to know what people think if you have seen them so certainly let us know give us your feedback on whether you agree or disagree with our versions of these movies and and what your favorite kurosami movie is if you've seen one tim i'm curious are you going to watch more of his movies now that you've seen the cougar trilogy oh certainly yeah even though i mean yes in certain senses there's stuff about these movies i didn't like but i still again really love his voice and again and this the kind of beauty he finds in tragic things that um really makes me want to check out more stuff i think i already said that i was going to try to I was really excited about trying to watch Chase of Cherry, and now I really want to buy that, and I will probably, at some point, when I have more money, 
buy that or buy it in the next sale or something like that because I am very kind of uh, keen to uh, check that film out. So yeah, definitely we'll do that. Yeah, I was happy to see that these films are on the Criterion channel. At least they are currently. I don't own them on physical copy yet, but they're definitely going on my list of perhaps November's <laughs> Barnes and Noble sale <laughs> if I get lucky. And yeah, I definitely want to watch Taste of Cherry next. That's going to be high on my list too. Worsley, so uh, you've bought a couple other, a uh, few other things since we last talked um, from the Criterion sale, which is now over. Um, the July sale anyway. Um, so what was the additional things that you bought since our last uh, discussion? So one that I'm really excited about um, that I picked up was the Wit Stillman trilogy. And I have seen um, the first of that that trilogy, but I haven't seen the other two. He's a filmmaker that, um, if you haven't checked him out, he I feel like he has a very uh, dry wit. I really enjoyed Metropolitan, which is the first movie of his that I saw takes place in 1990 again a lot of the people in it i believe it was their first film they hadn't done a lot of other movies and they haven't done a lot since then and it focuses on like you know young socialites in manhattan and having these debutante parties a world i know nothing about and you might think would be alienating but i found it greatly amusing and then the other two in this trilogy are barcelona and The Last Days of Disco. So I'm really excited to check those two movies out. And he's done, you know, a lot of other stuff as well. So certainly worth tracking down. Love and Friendship would be the one that I really was first drawn to. It was an ad- adaptation of Jane Austen, and it's hilarious. So I hope that gets the Criterion treatment at some point. And he also did Damsels in Distress in 2011, which I haven't seen, but I need to. So that was my my latest pickup. I was really hoping to get my hands on the Bruce Lee box set, but it kept being sold out every time I looked online and also in my local Barnes and Nobles. So I did not pick that one up yet, but that's on my list. So in terms of new uh, things that are coming up in Criterion's uh, calendar, uh, as we record this, there's only one thing new that they have listed that we hadn't talked about in the last one. But it was one, it's a rather bigger set that I know some people will be very excited about. It is uh, Essential Fellini, where they have a collection of not all of his films, I don't think, but just a collection of, well essential ones um they have let's see 14 films they did from 1950 to 1987 and i think even though i've been in multiple film classes and i would think that i would have seen at least one of these by now i don't think i've seen any of the ones that are in this set or i'm not even kind of remember for sure if i actually have seen any of fellini at all but um were you are you excited about this upcoming set I am, even though it means I'm going to have to rebuy some <laughs> uh, Fellini. I have and love La Dolce Vita. I, it's absolutely fabulous. You've got to watch it. And if you aren't familiar with Fellini's films, he works a lot with some of the same actors over and over, including Marcello Mastroianni, who is just one of my favorite actors, both his work with Fellini and with other Italian directors. So he's definitely worth checking out. But there's a lot on this set that I've been wanting to see for a while. Of course, um, if you're familiar with Fellini, the people, the, the one that most people have probably seen is Eight and a Half, mm-hmm. which is great. But there's also Juliet of the Spirits, which is a spiritualistic movie. And then there's just a whole bunch that I haven't seen that I'm excited to check out. So going all the way back to 1950 with Variety Lights, The White Sheik, Eva Toloni, and then kind of later on in his career, Amarcord is, I know, uh, really well known. I haven't seen that one, but I need to. And his film Inter Vista in 1987 closes out the set. And I think there is actually an appearance of Mastroianni in that one as well. So yeah, it looks like a really cool set. The pictures online are gorgeous. The artwork is beautiful, as always with Criterion. So this one is going on my wish list for sure. I think it comes out end of November. November so, 24th. Okay. Yeah, so that might go on my Christmas wish list. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I might. Um, actually, it'll come out just in time for that sale, so I'm sure a lot of people will buy it for the November sale if they're still hopefully doing that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I might I might use this. Um, <laughs> yeah. I might use this as a chance to um, finally watch some Fellini properly. But um, then in terms of Criterion Channel stuff, one thing I do want to highlight that I just stumbled across, which I haven't watched yet, is a 1988 documentary called uh, Comic Book Confidential, um, which is talking to, uh, the director of that is talking to various popular, I think, writers and artists from the comic book time and kind of 
tracing certain stuff from the 30s up until the then present 80s. Um, so again, keep in mind it's 1988, so a lot of the stuff that's happened, a lot of stuff has happened in terms of appreciation for the art form, in terms of people's point of view of it, is not going to be in there because it was 1988. So do keep that in mind when you watch it. Yeah, it looks like it's about an hour and a half, so um, I'm looking forward to taking a dive into that. So there's a couple things. The first one that I really want to get into is they have a feature on Australian New Wave, and it includes things I have seen, like Mad Max, but also some things I've been meaning to see for a long time and haven't yet, including The Last Wave, which is another Peter Weir movie, My Brilliant Career from Gillian Armstrong, uh, Gallipoli, The Year of Living Dangerously, and Walkabout is on there. If you haven't seen Picnic at Hanging Rock, that's one of them, and that's great. I will keep harping on that one. And then uh, Starstruck is one that I've been really anxious to see, and it's all about New Wave, and it's a pop musical, and it looks super fun. So I may even watch that in the next couple of days. It just looks like the burst of energy that we all need right now. Okay, so before uh, Rosalie wraps us up, just a heads up for the next few months. Next month in September, we're going to be talking about the uh, Andre Gregory and Wallace Shawn three film set. Um, in October, we t- we'll be talking about a few horror films, all kind of in the golden age of Hollywood area, those being The Island of Lost Souls, then I have The Hunter and Cat People. And in November, it'll be the one-year anniversary of the podcast. Um, so we're going to be talking about, because of 25 Years Later's origins as a kind of David Lynch and specifically Twin Peaks website before it expanded into other topics, uh, we will be talking about David Lynch's uh, Criterion films not uh, Twin Peaks, the, the Twin Peaks movie, though, which we'll explain why when we get to that podcast in November. But we will be talking about Eraserhead, uh, Blue Velvet, uh, Mulholland Drive, and the recent Criterion release, um, Elephant Man. And that's the stuff kind of coming up um, near the end of the year. Well, thank you so much again for listening to yet another episode of the Criterion Collectors podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Rosalie Lewis. And you can find me on Twitter at Cinema Pack Rat. And you can locate our podcast and lots of other great content on 25yearslatersite.com. I know Tim also has some stuff on YouTube, and I also write for atthismovie.com, so feel free to check those out too. And we super look forward to talking to you next time.